Anyway, my talk is on risk fractures in geriatric patients. Um, uh, I thank Dr. Ashok Sham for the invite. Happy to be a part of Vaira Global and partner with uh, 70 other global associations. In the hierarchy of dreary world of fragility fractures, risk comes second, next only to the hip fractures. Approximately 10% of white women older than 65 years will suffer from distal radius fracture during their lifetime. Principles of fracture treatment, it is different then and now. Earlier in the Abraham police era, it was the caste which was the gold standard. But now in this modern era, no longer caste is a gold standard. So for my treatment decisions, for my patients, what are my twin considerations? What is that I took into before I go into the decision making of the treatment? Well, one is fracture characteristics. Another is the patient characteristics, which are very vital. Fracture characteristics, I rely on the history given to me. If it's a low energy trauma, that is fall from a level ground, usually the fracture is extraticular, typical coolies, and uh, stable. Whereas in higher, higher energy trauma, like fall from stool, there is metaphyseal comminution, presence of intraarticular extension, there will be shortening, and usually it's an unstable fracture. There are signs of instability, and this form an indication for surgery. Fracture risk factors that I consider, which makes treatment difficulties, one is age, Initial displacement, ulnar fracture, intraarticular involvement, displacement more than six millimeters, osteoporosis, radiological outcome and functional outcome do not match in geriatrics. No correlation between unsatisfactory radiographic results and functional outcomes. Then the second one which I look is the patient characteristics that dictate the choice of treatment. What are the functional demands of each patient who comes to us? What is the pre-injury activity status? Patients' independence, self-care, spouse care, very important in GRI patients, cultural barriers, surgery may be a taboo, and is that a dominant hand? And the risk of surgery, anesthetic risk has to be considered. Yesterday years, geriatric population had low functional demand. Welcome to the present day geriatric group. They feel young and active. They want to be independent, want to cook their own food, do household activities. They want to do their household works. They want to be independent, drive their own vehicles. They want to play sports and keep themselves fit. The few are into active sports and even weightlifting. So few want to take care of themselves and be independent. Few want to take care of their ailing spouse. And if few even get married well into their sunset of lives. So this is the modern geriatric patients. And we need to look at the demands of this. Uh, you can call them young, you know, but yet old patients, you know, whose requirement has changed drastically now in the present times. Hence, there is a paradigm shift from caste to more aggressive methods in unstable geriatric risk fractures. In undisplaced stable fractures, I do the old fashioned casting. Uh, I look for the bone quality. The results are usually good. I cast it, forget it, simply because unlike in the, unlike the younger group, functional limitations do not matter in geriatric patients. In displaced distal radial fractures, there are five treatment options. I use all of them in different situations. Before treatment, I make sure to go through these four parameters concerning distal radius. And now the question is, is it really necessary to restore these radiographic parameters? Cortical bone, I look into what is the quality, radial angulation, radial length, palmar tilt, ulnar variation. Restoration of ulnar variation, variance and ulnar tilt is enough for good functional outcome. Smaller variations of other radiographic parameters do not matter in risk fractures. Now the number one option for, you know, when do I use this option for close reduction and casting? Most stable, minimally displaced fractures are treated by me in this way, either under GA or local blocks or even local anesthesia. Forearm cast in neutral position for six weeks. There's no difference between the long and short, short cast. I realized that morbidity associated with the long arm, long arm cast in elderly is not justifiable. For me, it is still the gold standard in undisplaced stable or mildly displaced fractures. And um, uh, what are my you know, criteria for ac accepting the reductions? In instability, what is my acceptable reduction? Dorsal tilt is if the daughter, dorsal tilt is less than 20 degrees, radial shortening is less than three millimeters, intra-article step less than two millimeters. When there is minimal you know, displacement, you know, I usually accept uh, this you know, uh, reduction you know, parameters. Then close reduction and casting, I find it ideal. In, uh, in uh, low demand patients, sedentary lifestyles, I do early mobilization to prevent stiffness, particularly, particularly in arthritic and cost effective, residual deformity should not you know, 
matter much. Well, uh, the option number two, close reduction and percutaneous fixation, simple method for reducible extra-articular and simple intra-articular fractures where the bone quality is good and less combination. And I noticed improved radiological parameters at the end of one year. There is no difference in pain, range of motion, grip strength, ADL, and SF36 after one year. It just improves the radiological parameters compared with the cast. So close reduction and percutaneous internal fixation is a, is a good technique. And I use these three techniques for percutaneous internal fixation. One is radial standard pinning, crisscross pinning, and intrafocal pinning. Um, the radial styloid pinning, two methods I use. One is passing two pins across the radial styloid, and another one is one pin through the radial styloid, other just adjacent to the wrist joint. And I found that the results are almost same. I remove the wires after four weeks, forearm cast a supplement, and remove it after six weeks. And when I use this crisscross technique, I use this crisscross technique if I find a metaphyseal combination like this after reduction uh, at metaphyseal collapse at the fracture site. I usually use the crisscross technique. And when do I use the intrafocal pinning technique? I prefer this when there is more combination and there is a good bone stock. And I go for this technique, you know, which gives stable reduction, stable fixation. And you know, the, usually the results are extremely good. All my results have been good in cases with good acceptability by my patients uh, in this, uh, you know, techniques. Uh, there are some complications that I have encountered in percutaneous interfixation, and uh, the commonest being the pin tract infection and you know migration of the pins in few cases and malunion but um, most of the patients accept the malunion and you know so that you know uh, it is not a big issue in senior citizens they they are okay with you know this kind of results if they can you know uh, avoid uh, volar locking systems and all they are okay with this results and if there is a fracture and which is more complex displaced i usually prefer external fixators it is a method of choice in highly unstable and severely committed fractures. It is simple and rapid, relies on ligament taxis. I prefer joint span, spanning rather than non bridging. Better radial length restored after one year, but other parameters remain the same. It prevents the joint stiffness. And uh, in some cases, I have used buttress K wire pinning in complex distal radius fractures with greater metaphyseal void. Fracture stability increased by supplementary K wires proved that there is no long term difference between external fixation and internal external figure buttress k wires then comes the fifth option uh, or, or uh, open reduction internal fixation volar plate versus volar locking system when i want a stable fixation and anatomical reduction this technique when i want early post operative wrist, wrist mobilization i prefer this technique why and how this choice is different i found good to excellent results in other methods which i enumerated rate of recovery is slow adl is most affected over delay of six months in functional recovery, I have found that all these are overcome by ORIF. And uh, when I plan for surgery, I pay, I pay attention to all this. Take careful history. I understand my patient's needs. I do proper pre-operative medical assessment. I prefer locking fixation system because of osteoporosis. I prefer the OLAR approach. I tactfully handle the fracture reduction. I do careful soft tissue handling. I do proper rehabilitation. Earlier, I used to do this conventional buttress plating, not anymore. At the time, I used to use bone graft, not bone substitutes. Even rarer, I used additional dorsal plates. Now, for me, all this is a thing of the past because of OLAR fixed angle plates, which has overcome all this thing. Now, OLAR fixed locking plates, where does this score in my patients? I found increased mechanical stability with this system. It overcomes the need for of a bone graft. It acts as an internal fixator. Screw locks to the plate and not to the bone. For me, it is a boon for my osteoporotic bones or in my patients. I found that it restores the normal axial force distribution. I have found that it gives good subcontral support even in short term distal fragments. I did have some complications, like you can see that one of the screw is within the joint here, and there was you know the tendon attrition. But these were rarer. So what does the evidence say? What is the experience? And uh, they say that. 24 weeks conservative versus open reduction internal fixation, 24 weeks better wrist extension, but same after one year. Disability of wrist, shoulder, hand, dash, pain, same in both the groups. Grip, step, grip strength and radiographic appearance better in ORIF group. Functional recovery at the end of one year did not differ much in both the groups. Radiographic results were better, but functional results were comparable during the long-term follow-up. 
So take home message here is due to the increasing life expectancy, distal radial fractures are on the rise in geriatric age group. Conventionally, can, uh, this, uh, uh, can, uh, the conventional therapy is the treatment of choice like close reduction casting or close reduction and, and pinning. With increasing active lifestyle, open reduction and fixation is emerging as an effective option. Osteoporosis porosis makes implant fixation difficult. OLR FLPs have emerged as a new successful option for rigid fixation and early mobilization. So to just conclude, in undisplaced fractures, I just cast it. If I find anyone in mildly displaced fracture, I reduced it. And if I find there is no displacement within the cast after 10 days, I continue to treat it non-operatively. Otherwise, surgery becomes an option for me. And in the distal, uh, I mean, displaced uh, distal radial fractures, I face the you know, dilemma of decision making like any other surgeon, but I base my decision on patient and fracture characteristics. And if surgery is the option, I choose from these four options, which I told uh, you. So now the, uh, the review of literature, Chang et al, over 60 years, when the methods of treatment over 60 years, it all five methods. So what does this all five methods review say? Worse radiographic results in cast group, better radiological results in VLPs, but important is functional results were same in both the groups after a year. Major complications requiring no surgery seen in bridging external fixator group, major complications requiring secondary surgery seen in VLPs. Poor functional demand, uh, you know, makes accurate result not a must. So with this, uh, when the, no method is you know, making a difference, and what is that di that dictates my decision making? It's the age, patient's comfort, early return to activities of daily living, early return to sports if they are into it, pre-injury, daily activity level, lifestyle requirement, current medical condition, stage of osteoporosis. Earlier, I used to never treat osteoporosis, but now I do. I have stopped making this mistake of not treating the osteoporosis and treating only the fracture because osteoporosis always comes with a secondary fracture 86% of the time. So this wrist fracture has to be used to prevent the other major hip or spine fractures that may happen. I treat osteoporosis uh, with um, the standard drug regime. The, I prefer cariparatide, though I use, you know, most of the times patients cannot afford PTH, then I go for zoledronic acid. I have given zoledronic acid, but it is a long term, you know, uh, uh, once a year dose. And uh, I was not very comfortable with that. So I prefer this combination of drugs like calcium, vitamin D, and even bisphosphonates like um, zoledronic acid. And then cariparatide is the, the drug of choice for me. Um, and this is the dose for 18 months. So Along with that, to treat osteoporosis, I also advise the patient on general nutrition, fall prevention, exercise, modifying the risk factors like smoking alcohol to be stopped, treating the comorbidities and pharmacological agents. So this becomes the comprehensive management of late. Earlier, it was a conventional management where only the fracture treatment was important. Now it is fracture treatment and treatment of osteoporosis, both which makes the treatment comprehensive. I, I follow this now and I advise everyone to follow this. So in a nutshell, after diagnosis of a wrist fragility fracture, I follow the fracture management principles as discussed. I focus on proper rehabilitation. I treat osteoporosis. I strictly advise the secondary preventive measures to my patients to reduce the risk of falls, to reduce, the, to decrease the risk of secondary fractures, because our patients are different now. Earlier, they were low demand patients, not very active, high surgical risk for their multiple comorbidities, osteoporosis. This made conservative treatment very popular. But now things have changed. Majority are still active. The, the, the life expectancy has gone up. 70 years, people are still playing sports, demanding lifestyles, want to return to activity earlier. So. VLS, that is volar locking system, give a rigid fixation of the fracture and mobilize them early is now you know, coming to the fore and maybe the answer in the future. So you can see that how the senior citizens have changed. So we may now have to reconsider the way we treated the geriatric wrist fractures. So the paradigm shift from conventional to comprehensive, a hip fracture and the wrist fracture cannot be ignored. We cannot just forget, uh, treat and forget because it warns of future fractures at other important sites. In women, risk of hip fracture rises 1.4 to 1.8 times. And in men, risk of hip fractures rises 2.3 to 2.7 times. By ignoring the risk fracture, we may end up and not treating the osteoporosis. We may be, end up jeopardizing our patients with hip or spine fractures. So we need to prevent secondary fractures from happening. It comes with a big socioeconomic price. And not as Dr. Amar says, and as Dr. 
future. She can said medical legal issues also could be a big problem if we forget to treat osteoporosis. If a patient who had a risk fracture develops subsequent fracture of the spine or the hip, and if we fail to treat osteoporosis, well, we may be in the dock for not treating the osteoporosis. So it's time to salute our risks. Risk is a wonderful creation of God. We owe our life to our risk. All our activities happen through the risk. All our activities. If the risk breaks, our life breaks, more so in geriatric patients. And in that age, they want an independent life. They want a pain-free life. A good risk will enable them to achieve that. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Ashok. And thank you very much, Global Virok, for partnering with Josie in these academic pursuits. Thank you very much. Thank you.